And then the final thing I want to talk about is uh, muscle damage um, and, and eccentric training in particular, but uh, more, more just like mitigation of muscle damage in general. Uh, so I wrote an article titled, Does Eccentric Training Always Cause More Muscle Damage? The title of the article I was reviewing was uh, eccentric exercise per se does not affect muscle damage biomarkers early and late phase adaptations uh, by a name I don't feel like trying to pronounce uh, <laughs> out of respect you, you wouldn't possibly disrespect them by no I'm gonna their... I'm gonna roll the dice Margaritellis maybe anyway uh, so this study w was pretty straightforward. They took a group of untrained in individuals, uh, split them in half, randomized them into groups, and had them do isokinetic knee extensions once once per week of t for 10 weeks. Uh, and all of these training sessions were just five sets of 15 maximal repetitions. And one group did five sets of 15 maximal concentric reps. So, you know, basically you set up the dynamometer to only move at a slow angular velocity and you just say, kick, 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 as hard as you possibly can for five sets of 15, uh, concentric only. And then the other group did eccentric only reps. So again, you set the dynamometer at a slow angular velocity, and it's going to flex your knee. And what you're trying to do is resist it with as much force as possible. Um, so over the 10 weeks, the researchers monitored uh, quite a few indirect markers of muscle damage. So uh, they assessed pain-free range of motion, uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, isometric peak torque at 90 degrees of knee flexion, concentric peak torque, eccentric peak torque, creatine kinase levels, uh, which is a, a indirect marker of muscle damage, and C-reactive protein levels, which is a marker of inflammation. Uh, they assessed all of those things for a couple of days after each training session throughout the entire 10-week protocol. Uh, and what they found is that for the first couple of training sessions, uh, they found exactly what you would expect. Uh, the eccentric training caused way more muscle damage than the concentric training for every marker of muscle damage and performance they looked at. So pain-free range of motion was decreased to a greater extent. Delayed onset muscle soreness was greater. Uh, isometric torque decreased to a greater extent, concentric torque decreased to a greater extent, eccentric torque decreased to a greater extent, larger elevations in creatine kinase levels, and larger elevations in C-reactive protein levels. So for the first three weeks of training, every single one of those markers indicated greater muscle damage for eccentric training than, concent than concentric training. From weeks four to seven, it was kind of a transitional period where some of those indirect markers of muscle damage kind of dropped out of showing a difference between uh, exercise protocols. So like on week four, most of the markers still suggested more muscle damage with eccentric training, but now concentric peak torque changes post-training, they didn't differ between groups anymore. By week six, you're no longer seeing differences in soreness, isometric peak torque, concentric peak torque and C-reactive protein. And then uh, from weeks uh, eight to 10, you basically weren't seeing differences between exercise protocols at all. Um, there, there was no indication that the eccentric only training was still causing more muscle damage than the concentric only training. So uh, I, I think that this was a pretty powerful illustration that uh, when we talk about the repeated bouts effect and the ability of muscles to protect themselves and become more resilient against muscle damage over time, uh, a kind of a, a question there is like, to what extent can those adaptations occur? Like what, what can the muscles kind of on the upper end of things protect themselves against to mitigate muscle damage? And this study suggests to me that they can... Uh, <laughs> that that functionally there's limitless capacity. And, and the reason I say that is like, you know, the practical question is, can the repeated bout effect occur to such an extent that normal resistance training no longer causes really any significant level of muscle damage? And if they were finding uh, basically no indication that muscle damage was occurring by the end of 10 weeks in this study with that eccentric training protocol, that suggests to me that 
you can absolutely get to the point where virtually no muscle damage is occurring with just normal training. The reason I say that is this eccentric training protocol was, it, it's hard to overstate how much more brutal it was than anything that anyone would ever do in the gym for the purpose of just like normal resistance training. So you hear five sets of 15 and you think like, oh, that's, uh, that's kind of high volume work. I think I'd be a little sore from that. Five sets of 15 is not the same thing as five sets of 15 maximal eccentric reps. Um, I mean, like just one set of 15 maximal eccentric reps would, would probably uh, cripple most people. No matter how well trained you are, if you did like the first week of the eccentric training protocol here, I promise you, you would be wrecked for three or four days. Like that's, that's an enormous amount of eccentric stress. So if the subjects could fully kind of accommodate that after just 10 weeks of training, which uh, was just 10 sessions of training because they were only training once per week, uh, that suggests that within kind of practical boundaries, uh, the repeated bout effect is is sufficient to, to probably mitigate virtually all muscle damage that occurs. And so... Um, I think that this is very relevant for people who who wonder like, hey, man, I, I've been training consistently for a while. I used to get kind of sore after training. I don't really get sore anymore. Is that a sign that something is wrong? Probably not. Um, soreness significantly mitigating and and perhaps going away completely over time. That's a very normal outcome. Um and, and it's perfectly fine. There, there's no strong evidence that soreness is particularly predictive of training outcomes. So, um, you know, that, that is a normal thing to expect and you shouldn't be concerned about it. Uh, conversely, you may be wondering like, hey, if the subjects here in this study uh, were, were basically mitigating all muscle damage after 10 weeks of training, why do I still get sore if I've been training consistently for a while? And I think probably the main contributor is just exercise variety or training variety. You know, you're changing rep ranges, you're changing exercise, you're maybe changing range of motion and how you're executing reps, et cetera. Um, and, and repeated bout effect related adaptations are both general and specific. So if you are someone who's reasonably well trained in a particular style of training and you do uh, workout with a different style of training, um, you, you have some general protective adaptations such that you will probably be less sore following that training session than a completely untrained person would be. But, uh, the adaptations are specific to some degree. So, you know, you don't, you don't have, uh, full muscle damage resistance against all things that could possibly cause muscle damage. So, uh, a key component of this study was subjects did do the exact same exercise protocol every time. It was five sets of 15 maximal eccentric knee extensions um, at a fixed angular velocity um, through a fixed range of motion. So once you start changing variables around, uh, you are probably still causing some muscle damage uh, due to some degree of novelty and variety in your training. So, you know, it, it's... It's reasonable to expect some degree of soreness moving forward, especially if training variables are shifting, but it's also very reasonable to expect uh, very, very substantial decreases in muscle soreness, perhaps going away entirely. Th those are both very, very normal uh, outcomes of training, and neither of them suggest that anything bad is going on. So if you've, if you've ever worried about anything related to soreness. Am I not getting sore enough? Am I getting too sore? It's probably fine. Everything's fine. You don't need to worry about it. Um, and then the last thing I want, I kind of wanted to draw out of this study is I think that these findings are relevant to the idea of training to failure. So um, one of the ideas that I think people have falsely gotten about me uh, is that I'm against training to failure, that, I, that I'm an anti-failure crusader. Um, and like, I'm just, I'm not. Uh, so I have argued multiple times uh, and will continue to do so that you don't need to train to failure uh, 
every set to maximize the per set hypertrophy uh, outcomes. Uh, if you're acquainted with the quote unquote effective reps model of hypertrophy, I've argued against that. I, I don't think that the evidence substantiates it. And I think that there's a, a pretty reasonable amount of evidence against it. Um, but the, the statement of, I don't think you need to go to failure all the time to maximize hypertrophy is not the same as I am against training to failure. And in fact, I do most of my training to failure, um, not for squat bench deadlift, but for basically everything else, largely because I think it idiot proofs training. Um, like, you know, I don't want to have to think about my level of effort when I'm exercising. Um, you know, I, it, I, I think if I'm trying to think like, okay, what is the perfect submaximal amount of effort to exert to minimize the fatigue accumulated in this set, but maximize the hypertrophic adaptation in this set? I don't know. Some people maybe are into that. I'm fucking not. Uh, like, I'm going to think about it a little bit for my core lifts. For everything else, I just want to turn my brain off and lift stuff. Like, I like lifting stuff and making myself tired. That's, those are some of the things I love about training. Um, so I just don't want to have to think about it too, too hard. I think that training to failure largely idiot proofs your training. And when I'm training, I am an idiot. Um, <laughs> now, is that, is that failure failure or is it like volitional failure without digging into like my absolute top gear? That's like failure, failure. Okay. Um, it depends on the lift. Uh, like, I don't like being pinned by squats. Um, right. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's not my favorite thing. But for, I don't know, like dumbbell press, I'm just going to press until like I can't actually get the weights up anymore. And then I yeah. say, oh, well, I guess I'm done. No more reps. Yeah. Uh, tricep extensions, same thing. Just keep going. Once I can't lock it out, you know, I'm just going to bring the bar to my chest, close grip, press it up. So, yeah, I mean, like failure, failure. Um, so, yeah. And one of the because I, I just want to say I went back into your lifting videos. And when you claim to go to failure, I actually found that you had seven reps oh left in the God. tank. Oh, we're not we're not doing this. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so people who are like actually anti failure training, the, the biggest argument they'll bring up is that there's, there's plenty of research. It's not, it's not even worth citing individual studies. There is a robust and flourishing body of evidence, uh, showing that when you train to failure, it causes, uh, larger decrements in performance pre to post training and uh, requires longer to recover from an exercise session than doing kind of uh, uh, non-failure training that's equated for reps or total volume load. And so, you know, people will argue that like eh, the cost benefit calcul calculus doesn't make sense here. If you can get just as much muscle growth, not training to failure, uh, but when you train to failure, you're causing more fatigue, you're taking longer to recover, and you're not really getting anything in return, that constitutes a strong reason to not go to failure in training and to advocate against really ever training to failure. Um, but I don't go that far. And and some of the findings from this study and you know prior to the study being published, just my own experience, constituted reasons why I don't necessarily buy that argument. Um, so, you know, if people can acclimate to five sets of 15 of maximal eccentric reps, I think people can fucking acclimate to training to failure um, such that like if you do if you do a study in, in you uh, th this kind of drifts off your point you made about muscle protein synthesis research. If you put people through unaccustomed exercise, they're not used to it's causing a lot of muscle damage. Maybe MPS isn't necessarily representative. I think the same thing applies to research looking at how different training variables impact muscle damage and fatigue and recovery from training, where if you're putting someone through an unaccustomed exercise protocol, their post-exercise response to that may not necessarily be representative of how their post-exercise response would look 
if they trained in that manner for a matter of weeks or months. And, and that's been my experience with, uh, with failure training. Like if, if I've been doing a highly specific block of powerlifting stuff with really no accessory work, um, and not doing basically any training to failure, then like, you know, when I, when I toss in some skull crushers and just like really push myself to the limits, my triceps are going to be fucked for three or four days after that. But then if I do it for like three weeks, four weeks or something like that, eh, my triceps don't get sore anymore. And they don't, they don't really seem to be any more fatigued post training than they would be if I didn't go to failure. So I, I think that this study indirectly supports that observation that, you know, most things that might cause more muscle damage than other things. And in this case, I'm talking about training to failure. I think if you do those things, whatever they are for not even that extended of a period of time, but like, you know, four five, six, seven, eight workouts. Um, I think eventually your body just adapts to it. You acclimate. It no longer causes that much additional muscle damage or fatigue and it's fine. So, uh, I, and I, I could just be kind of playing into my own confirmation biases here. Cause brother, you're never going to get me to, to estimate reps in reserve on a set of rear delt flies. I'm never going to do it. Yeah. Like that's always going to failure. Uh, and you know, if I'm wrong, if that's suboptimal, I don't fucking care. Cause I, <laughs> I am never going to tell you my RPE for a set of, of delt raises. It's always 10. It's only ever going to be 10. I'm not going to stop that shy of failure. And you can't make me. 